Welcome to Perry Pierre Podcast. I am your host, Perry Pierre. Our guest today is Bruce Van Dusen. Very he's good. A, <laughs> he's a Very director good. who's had a lot of success in the commercial industry. He recently released a book called 60 Stories About 30 Seconds. So, sir, how are you doing? Good, thank you. Thank you for having me on the podcast, Perry. I'm happy to get a chance to hang out with you a little bit, talk. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so you went to uh, Boston University. Uh, was it there that your passion for filmmaking started? You know, I started um, making little films. I mean, really little films with Super 8 film when I was maybe in elementary school or junior high school. You know, I got somehow I got my hands on a little movie camera and I tried to play around and um, mm -hmm. do little jobs then, uh, sort of just to see what filmmaking was about. And then, uh, you know, I was a, but I was a kid, so I was interested in sports and I was interested in this little movie camera and I was interested in musical instruments. I was interested in everything. So mm -hmm. I never really focused on it, but I kept coming back to it. High mm -hmm. school, I spent a little bit more time during, um, art classes, trying to see if I could make films, same in college. And then um, in the middle of my sophomore year of college, I was kind of trying to figure out whether I wanted to be either a preschool teacher mm -hmm. or uh, to switch off and go into filmmaking. And I decided uh, to go into filmmaking. So I left University of Colorado in Boulder, and I transferred to Boston University, which had a mm -hmm. big film department. Oh, okay. Wow, that's nice. Um, and then after Boston University, it was there actually, because I read in your book that it was there, you met someone who was completing his master's, and then while you were completing your bachelor's degree, and then both of you guys moved to New York. That's right. correct. Yeah, I had, when I was graduating, somehow I got my requirements done a little one semester early which saved me some money and uh so i was graduating um in december and i mm -hmm. met a guy i had posted a note on the you know on the in the on the bullet board in the lobby of one of the school buildings <laughs> anybody else was graduating early and interested in moving to new york and this guy was and so uh we rented a place and both set about trying to find jobs in the film industry, both of us knowing nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the first job was winter, so it was very, very unpleasant wandering the streets of New York trying to find a, find a job. And um, he managed to get hired first, Perry. He got hired uh, by a commercial company to mm -hmm. do drive a truck. And that was what his master's degree entitled him to was driving a truck. And, <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah. And he, um, he went to the, to the job, uh, the next morning and he called me very early. I was still at home. I hadn't left yet. And he said, do you know how to drive a stick shift? And I said, yeah, of course I do. And he said, I don't, can you come down and replace me? So I did. And I drove this truck and amazing thing was it took me, you know, I was suddenly working on a commercial. So as I finished my day, I went and onto a sound stage and watched 70 big beefy mm -hmm. Irish Catholic, Italian grips, gaffers, camera assistants, prop people, watched all these guys make a television commercial, which mm. I had no idea involve that much uh, manpower and that much time and effort and that much, you know, expertise. So mm -hmm. kind of opened my eyes to a business that I didn't know existed. The first commercial that you ever directed was for Crazy Eddie. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What would you say are some of the most important lessons that you learned from that experience? Well, um, I think I think the the lesson that um, stuck with me from that that I that I continued to assume was true, and I should 
should respect for the next 45 years mm -hmm. was that I never said no to an opportunity. Mm -hmm. I figured that if someone was giving me the opportunity to work, I should take it. And as I would just, I used to describe it in, if to um, film classes, if I would sit in, I would say, if anybody was paying me money to run film through a camera, I, I thought that was great, so I should do it. The mm -hmm. thing is, in order to make films, you have to convince somebody to pay for it. They have to hire you or they have to fund the production. Mm -hmm. So what I learned with Crazy Eddie was um, I went to a first meeting and I told them what my ideas were and they told me my ideas were terrible. Um, that's okay. I'd had mm -hmm. the meeting. And then a couple of weeks later, um, they called me and said, would you come back and talk to us again? But this time I had to go and um, meet the guy who owned the company uh, in his hospital room. He'd been mugged and stabbed 16 times. So uh, when I went into this room, I'm looking at a guy who looks like he's the mummy. You know, he's wrapped in gauze <laughs> and he has one arm in a cast and his jaw is wired shut. He's got a leg in traction. And the, 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 the ad guy is saying, okay, go ahead, tell him your ideas. This was, this was ridiculous, you know, that yeah. I was having a meeting with this guy. But somehow he couldn't speak. He just grunted. But apparently he grunted yes, because mm -hmm. at the end of the meeting, the ad guy said, okay, go make the ad. And <laughs> I did. And uh, one thing led to another, and it got a little bit of... Uh, notoriety in the newspapers and suddenly I was a commercial director. But I think that if I had asked too many questions, Perry, like when the guy called me and said, I want you to come to another meeting. And I said, great, where am I going? And he goes, you're coming to Roosevelt Hospital. And I found out the circumstances. I probably would have begged off. I would have thought, nah, I'm not, that's too weird. <laughs> yeah. But I've gone to so many weird, weird meetings and had so many very strange phone calls that have resulted in me being able to work that I've, I, I learned long ago that I would take any phone call and go to any meeting because who knows? Who knows what was going to happen? Yeah. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, you mentioned in the book, and I quote, I don't know if what I learned that day qualified as a rule. Uh, what I did learn was that a good director would admit he wasn't always sure what would work doing both shooting and editing and would try something different at the risk of being wrong, just as an experiment. Sometimes you never know. Um, I don't know, kind of like that, that, that kind of like resonated with me um, for a minute when I, as I was reading the book. Um, so a normal career span uh, for a commercial director is about 10 years. Why do you think it's so short compared to maybe like a film director or like a TV uh, director? Um, it's another good question. You know, it's a, it's a very fickle, trendy business. And um, people who work, people who hire you, who are the creative people in ad agencies, tend to be uh, very susceptible to whatever is cool that month, mm -hmm. whatever the trend may be. So that means that you can come out of nowhere and suddenly start shooting a lot. But it usually also means that just as you came out of nowhere quickly, you're going back to nowhere really quickly. <laughs> yeah. So my, in features, you know, if you, if you make a movie or two and you, you know, they do okay, you can, you know, try to keep making a movie every couple of years. Episodic directors, I think, probably can, when they get a little bit of momentum, I think they can get they can really cobble together a normal career. Commercials is just, is just strange because also, you know, a normal commercial is a day or two days work. So it's not like doing a show, an episodic show where it's 10 days or a movie where it's four months. Um, so I think you're fighting, you're up against trends and I never wanted to be trendy. I tried to just be 
a solid generalist storyteller. So that meant I never got too popular, but it also meant that I never, um, it, it also meant that I wasn't at risk of just being tossed because I was no longer the flavor of the month. I was trying to just be a solid professional filmmaker. And uh, I always say that to <coughs> younger directors that I meet, because they, you know, it's, a, it's really hard to put together a career that goes for longer than five, 10 years. Mm -hmm. And I just try to, I just try to make sure that they understand the idea that um, if they're doing something that's more solid and, you know, storytelling, it's so, it sounds so silly, you know, everybody, novelists and, and filmmakers, even musicians, singer songwriters talk about being able to be good storytellers. But I think if you know how to do that, Perry, mm -hmm. you can carve out a living for yourself in commercials, in movies, in, mm -hmm. in television. I think you can do it. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Um, so one night, uh, we were having dinner with your family and, um, it seems like you, you got into an argument with your son and then he said, and I quote, you were never there. Um, how much of a toll did your career take on your family or even your marriage? And, um, I think I'll, well, uh, okay, yeah. And what advice would you give to, you know, filmmakers on, on how to kind of like, you know, juggle both of them, you know, a family and career. Um, I think that, Working in any creative industry makes having a stable, normal family life hard. Um, and I, I say that because the demands of it are just a little strange. You know, you're not going to an office every day. Mm -hmm. And even if you're, you know, the people who complain about this shit all the time are or <laughs> lawyers or investment bankers and they're going, Oh yeah, I'm working 18 hour days. And I go, yeah, but you're working in the same goddamn office and you come home and you, it's, <laughs> there's, there's a pattern to it. You know, there was a, there's a period of time in, in commercials. If you get busy where you're away two weeks a month, you know, you're just getting on a plane, you go to LA for a week, then you leave LA and you go to Milan, then you fly to Toronto, then you come to, you're having tremendous success in your professional life, but you are uh, putting your, you're, you're forcing your family to work really hard to like you because you're away a lot and you're not participating. I tended to think that I was around, I thought I was doing a good job, Perry, of being around, mm -hmm. but because I, as soon as I would finish a job, if I was shooting in Los Angeles, I would take the next plane back same day. Mm -hmm. If I would, even, even in Europe, or if I was shooting in South America, I would take the next plane I could get back. I would never say, eh, I'm here, I'm gonna spend another five days. Mm -hmm. But I think the cumulative effect, obviously I would listen to my kids or my ex-wife more than I would to my own recollections because they're the ones who experienced it. And my, and my son's comment was really right, which was to his 10 year old, 12 year old perception, I wasn't there. I thought I had a perfect solution because I was doing commercials. You know, I have friends who do movies and they would disappear for four months. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know how people, I don't know how marriages stay intact. <laughs> um, with that going on. I think it just puts too much strain. I mean, even when your family comes to visit once or twice, it's, it just puts a, it, it puts a lot of pressure on everybody and it's hard to stay connected. But it's, um, I think if you go into it with your eyes wide open and realize that it's going to be, you're going to have to work extra hard to, to maintain um, a good, solid, uh, marriage and, and parenting, then I, I think then you'll be, you, you can do it. Although uh, you've obviously looked at a bit of the book. So, you know, I mean, one of the jokes I make is mm -hmm. that if you meet a commercial director who's mildly successful, it's a given 
that he's divorced. <laughs> and then if yeah. he's really, really successful, he's been divorced two or three times. <laughs> so it, it, it's funny because, you know, I'm happily married and I, I, I don't worry too much about working very much anymore. But I'll tell you, it's, it's, it's the price. But look, I think it's the same thing musicians face. I think it's the same thing actors face. People who do mm -hmm. things that are creative, Perry, seem to have, seem to have the, the odds stacked against them in that way. I don't know why. Yeah, yeah, it's true. I mean, like you said, like schedule is, uh, and, and, and everything else. And being creative, sometimes it's like you have to be in your zone in order to be creative and, and um, that could take a, a toll on you and stuff. Um, yeah. So uh, I, I know like usually for, 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 uh, for commercials, like doing auditions, like the first one would be with the casting director, but the second one, like the callback, sometimes you, there would be the director of the commercial. Um, so do you have any pointers for actors on how to book commercial auditions? Um. I think that um, I think that one of the things that um, is I think the most difficult thing for any performer, mm -hmm. uh, particularly for actors, is to be themselves when they're auditioning. You can be standing there with someone in the waiting room and shooting the shit with them, and they're they're very engaging. They look right for the part. Their body language is great. And then when they come in and get in front of a camera, they suddenly become different. Mm -hmm. And I think that really, really good performers are able to, it's not push back against that, but I think that they're able to somehow access a very simple, natural quality in front of the camera where they don't feel like they're working. Mm -hmm. They don't feel like they're exaggerating. Um, they're not projecting too much. Everything is small and real. Yeah. Now, if you're trying to, if you're trying to get a job, Perry, in a, in a, oftentimes in, in what passes for comedy today in, mm -hmm. In, particularly in commercials, which is mostly terrible sight gags. <laughs> yeah. All it really depends on is how you look. True, yeah. But I think for, for good actors, the really good actors I've not I notice, and the ones that jump out at me are just completely natural. And strangely, when I hire them, particularly ones I don't know, and I meet them, in person and I'm starting to work with them, not as just the character, but then as somebody who's on the set with me, mm -hmm. they have exactly that same natural quality. Yeah. They just, they have a self-confidence to, uh, that allows them to just be themselves. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You mentioned, you mentioned in a, uh, in the book that, um, uh, you were, you were interviewing a lady for, for a commercial. It was like a small crew. And then um, you were just asking her questions, but she didn't know that, that she was being recorded. And you kind of did that because you wanted to get like the best, you know, version of the, of the interview that you could get. And I, uh, on that same set, like somebody, some, uh, someone was trying to back, back up the, the files onto a computer and then they, com they completely erased the whole memory card. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> yeah. So uh, what are, what are some of the, you know, uh, challenges that you've had to overcome on a set as a, as a commercial director other than, than that, obviously this is like, who. <laughs> well, you, you know, you whether you're making commercials or, or television shows or a movie, you're still, you're dealing with very complicated technology. So it's kind of a given that something technical will go wrong at some point in the day, at some point in the week. And um, I don't know if it's worse now with digital technology than it was when it was, uh, when we were dealing with actual 35 millimeter film. In those days, I felt like when things go wrong, things went wrong, somebody could repair it. 
Um, so you're, you're dealing with, with a, the, a, a technical disruption, which can cause everything to grind to a halt. And one of the things that I think is really important is to never stop moving once you walk in on the set. I think mm -hmm. that actors and crew people will give you their absolute best if you're moving forward all the time. If they're looking at a director who's sitting around in a chair, you know, trying to be self-importantly creative and think and it's bullshit. Do your job, mm -hmm. bef do your job before. When you're on the set, you've got all these people there and they're there to execute what you know how to do. Go, go do it, do your job, be a director. Um, so I think that uh, keeping momentum is right, being prepared so that you know what you're gonna do is right. Um, and I think also the, the, the other thing to, to, that you'll always encounter uh, as a problem is that people have personalities and stuff mm -hmm. happens on a given day. And I used to get very frustrated when people's personal lives, Perry, would sort of <laughs> disrupt fear. things. I would, yeah. you know, I would just want to say, get the fuck over it. We're doing the job. And, you know, sometimes you'd have horrible things happen. Somebody had had a death in the family. Mm -hmm. Somebody had had, um, somebody had had a kid who got sick in the middle of the night. Somebody, Somebody had had an, uh, an accident, uh, a car accident on the way to work or driving home the night before. Life intervenes. And I think as a director, you have to learn to respect those and be sensitive to them. But also, you can't have 70 people suddenly stop what they're doing mm -hmm. because one person has a problem. Listen, yeah. I, had a, I had a completely bizarre shoot in California where I get a phone call at about four in the morning from my assistant director who, and I, you know, I run a very calm world, so I don't know what's happening here. Mm -hmm. And, uh, he said, there's a problem. I said, there must be, if you're calling me at four in the morning. Mm -hmm. And he said, yeah, I just got a call from the little boy. We were doing a commercial with a family and had parents and, you know, actors, they weren't related, but there were a mother and father and a, a, a son and a daughter. Mm -hmm. I just got a phone call from the son's mother and her husband, the boy's father just died tonight. In wow. And they want to know what I want them to do in the morning. And I said, Jesus Christ, they want, that's their first phone call is to me about whether the kid should come to the commercial. Cause we'd already mm -hmm. been shooting for a day or two. So, mm -hmm. and I said, here's what I think. I think the kid should not come to work because I think the mother is going to be distraught. Mm -hmm. And I think everybody in the crew and all the actors are going to figure out that the kid's father died and they're going to be all very freaked out by the fact that this kid showed up to work mm -hmm. on a stupid commercial. Yeah. So, um, so the AD said, what do you want me to do? I said, tell them not to come to work. Tell them to deal with their family issues. So I still had to, and in the morning when we got to the set, you know, I still had to go over to the agency and explain to the actors the reason that the little kid's not here, and I knew I'd just shoot around it, but I said, the little kid's not here because there's been some difficult issue with his family. I didn't tell them the kid's father died. I just said, there's some complexities, but I'm gonna shoot around the kid and it's gonna be okay. At the end of the job, I explained to everybody what had happened. Um, but I'm sorry to sort of go on and with a- No, no, one. yeah, no, it's, a, it's a great but, story. But there's always there's always stuff that'll happen. It's a um, it's pretty much a given that something will happen, and it may hopefully it's it's small, but you'll have big things. It's real. You really have to think twice about whether you stop the show mm. because there's a lot of people involved in this, and it's 
business. There's a lot of money changing hands. So you got to think about whether you should do that. Yeah. Wow. No, I mean, I feel like, I feel like the other actors, like you gain a whole lot more of their respect after, after telling the kid, uh, or after telling the AD for, uh, for the kid not to come. Um, so what are, what are, what are the budgets now? Like, like a big commercial budget for right now? Well, it always depends on, on what you're shooting. Um, like something from McDonald's, I would say, since, You know, so many of the McDonald's commercials are uh, the many of the fast food commercials now are very uh, simple. Uh, big clients are trying to save money, Perry. You know, so they put as few a few actors in, so they reduce the residuals. They don't use a lot of locations. They try to always have you shoot in a store because then they don't have to pay a location fee. So you know, a, a one day shoot with two actors in a McDonald's, you know, is a production company would probably charge an agency $150,000. On the other hand, you'd be able to, if you went to Florida where you'd deal with everybody non-union, mm -hmm. you'd probably be able to make that commercial for $100,000. If you went to Texas, probably be able to make it for $85,000. Pay scales are different, whether you're paying pension or welfare. Let me just say overall, in commercials, just like in television and films, overall budgets are dropping. They want to spend less, as little as possible. And um, there's always a company out there willing to charge less. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Especially with like the digital world that we live in and people getting access to, you know, to a whole lot more for less, I would say. Exactly uh, right. Exactly right. Digital has sort of been digital has been wonderful in some ways, but it's also proved to make the, uh, the price that you sell things at, it, it, it's hard to charge as much. It, you, you can just do it simpler. Everything is simpler. Yeah. Um, I want to quote this paragraph in the book. Um, I went into a business I didn't know existed. Every choice I made was about creating a stable, predictable life. Turns out stability isn't tangible, reliable, or definable. Turns out life is about surprises and wrong turns and good luck and by choices and showing up on time. I wonder how things would have turned out if I'd been trying to really fuck it up. Can you reflect on that a little bit? Yeah. Um, I, was, I was often struck by the fact that when you were looking, when I was looking back at all of these things that had happened over the course of my 40, 45 years in it, um, that so much of what I was writing about and relating was saying, man, you know, I did this because, uh, you know, it seemed like it would be part of the plan. And if I did that, it was A and it would lead to B and it would lead to C. And if I, could charge this, then that would enable me to do this. And if I got married here and that, to that person and that, and we had a kid, it was, I felt like I was really operating with a great plan. Like I had, had looked at things and analyzed things and designed it. And I think as I got to, um, certainly as I got into my 40s and 50s as a director and I'd worked a ton, I would, I still realized, you know, I don't know that much. I know enough. <laughs> I know enough. I know way more than I did when I was 23, but I now realize that I'm never going to know everything. I know enough. Um, but one of the things that I think I needed to have in my brain, Perry, was this idea that I had stability or what I was doing was a, was something that was necessary to creating stability or creating a future or a guarantee or just solid, you know, solid ground under my feet. And I think part of that was because I didn't, I, I was nervous that if I had really admitted how, shaky being a, a, a creative person is, a director in particular, I think I would have had panic attacks all the time. 
Mm -hmm. It was so good to just fucking ignore it and look ahead and say, no, nope, okay, that's coming up. That'll be fine. It'll be fine. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, you know, look, I got this far and I live to tell and I'm still on the right side of the ground, as the Texans would say. So um, I, th I don't think I would change it, Perry. I think having mm -hmm. that kind of drive that was all about trying to make something happen and, and make something that would continue and have a life of its own, I think that helped me. Mm -hmm. But I think it helped that I also stayed a little bit stupid about stuff. <laughs> really helped because if I really admitted what was going on, I might, I might've had a lot less confidence. Mm. All right. Uh, and also final quote that I want to uh, mention, um, you say, but sometimes I would find myself standing in a doorway on the way to work, my face turned towards the building. So no one could see I was crying. I, I was I was reading that part and it's like part of me was like oh no, <laughs> um, could you could you reflect on that too a little bit please? Yeah, my my private life had fallen apart and uh, it was I was not proud of it. I felt responsible for it. I didn't understand really how I was responsible, but uh, because I was that kind of guy, I took responsibility. Mm -hmm. But I had had a, uh, uh, what seemed to me a, a successful and 20 year marriage mm -hmm. and um, three really good, cool kids. And suddenly I didn't, suddenly I was in, uh, suddenly I was informed that that marriage wasn't going to continue. Mm -hmm. So it, I looked and I thought, you know, I must have made, I must have made terrible mistakes to cause that. And I also mm -hmm. must have been, I didn't quite understand why I was so blindsided. And I think that that was part of why I'd find myself in those doorways on certain mornings because you know, I was just getting to a point where I thought, hey, I'm going to slow down and work a little bit and spend a little bit more time. Mm -hmm. But it was kind of too late. <laughs> and, and it was too late. And, you know, writing a book, I could look back on it and say, oh, there was that signal and there was that hint of it and there was that. But as I was living at Perry, I was, I was too caught up in what was going on. So it was, it was a big surprise. On the other hand, you know, things worked out. 10 years later, I met a credibly wonderful woman. And as reluctant as I was to admit that I wanted to get married again, I realized that I did. And uh, Victoria and I have been married now for 11 years and, wow, and the kids are all good and every, everything's fine now. But that was that was not fine. That was not a great moment. But as I'm sure you've lived in your life, um, those are important things to go through. You know, it's really, it's really meaningful when you get your ass kicked where you're, you know, your heart broken beating around <laughs> and you think, God, I don't want to do that again. Yeah. I better, I better, better figure out why I've, why I caused that to happen and not do that again. Yeah. Um, so what are some key lessons would you give to a filmmaker that just graduated from Boston University um, that is moving to New York and that's, that wants to become a commercial director? Um, it's a very weird moment in the business, as you know, because of COVID and yeah. uh, work is very limited. Um, on the other hand, I tend to think that owing to some of the things that you were talking about, mm -hmm. uh, the simplicity of digital and how that enables much smaller crews and, and younger people, non-union people, independent filmmakers to, to operate. I think there are big opportunities out there. 
I just, I'm an, I, I'm an old guy now looking back on it. So I'm not looking at it from that same perspective of trying to come through and find my first gig. But I know that if I was coming to New York, mm -hmm. I would do the same things that I did in 1976. <laughs> I would try to go door to door to the production companies. I, you, you couldn't really do that right now because the offices aren't open. Yeah. But I, but I would be identifying production companies, identifying the people inside the production companies who do the hiring of production assistants or coordinators or office workers, anything that's going to be enable you to get in. Mm -hmm. And I would be forthright and say, Hey, I know it's a terrible time and I know that there is not much going on, but when, and if it opens up again, I'd like you to, to think of me. And I'd also really try to stay woven into a community of young filmmakers because I'm noticing tons of stuff on the internet that seems to be young people just out of film school who are going out and doing independent little films. Some are four minutes long, some are about COVID, some are about politics, some are about um, Black Lives Matter, some are about how the people are spending time during quarantine. There's a million, there's a million different things going on. And these days, instead of having to pick up a huge camera and 35 millimeter film, you can pick up your goddamn phone and make a great film. Yeah. <laughs> Some phones are like amazing. Yeah. So I would say, you know, I would say, don't give up. I would, I would not get hugely f frustrated about the, it's not your responsibility that the businesses are all closed. That's, it's not your fault. So it's, I think it's good to just have a, have, you know, look at it and try to figure out how you're going to be able to support yourself for another couple of months till this all gets worked out. I'm a firm believer. It's all going to get worked out and uh, things will come back. And in a weird way, when they come back in this industry, they're going to come back insane because there's so much need for content. Yeah, no, I agree so much. <laughs> um, listen, I really, really enjoyed uh, the book. By the way, um, no, thank you. Thank I, you, you know, it was it was very honest and and um, you know you the, the the language. It was also like a very easy to read and to navigate through. Um, what are some of the key things that you want someone reading the book to take away? Um, I I kind of want them to to see that uh, I kind of want them to see that if you're going to go off and do something that's uh, a creative endeavor, uh, you got to have the stomach for it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think there were probably a hundred men and women in my graduating class, Perry. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's three of us who were able to work and have careers in the industry. Wow. So you gotta have you gotta have the stomach for it. And you've got to have the drive for it. And you've got to have the ability to roll with instability and somehow use that to your advantage. And then I think the other thing that I learned kind of writing the book was that everybody is haunted by um a feeling that they're going to be found out. Mm. I think everybody has some, to some degree, has a feeling about the fact that they're, you know, they're a fraud or that they're not as good as, as other people might think they are, or they're not as qualified. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what makes that worse is that we tend to think that we're the only ones who feel that <laughs> as far yeah. as I can determine every citizen of earth feels that. Mm. So it's kind of something that lets you relax a little when you realize looking across the room and you're nervous about what you're doing and you're, you know, you're particularly nervous about how you're being seen or perceived. It's really good to remember that everybody's nervous about it because they're, they think you're looking at them. 
and right. you're and they're looking at you and you're looking at them and we could we, we could do a little better if we could be aware of that and 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 not so nuts about it um and i and i also think that it's uh, i'd also like people to come away uh, after having read the book and and see that you know if you're fortunate enough to really have a good run at something that you like doing that you can remember both the things that you enjoyed in it, but also the things that drove you crazy. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes what I remind people of is, you know, I'll, I'll, particularly when I'm working with around younger creatives, particularly younger directors, and they go ballistic about something that they're having to manage. And I say, you don't understand. This is why you're getting paid. <laughs> The yeah. only time people will drive you crazy is when they feel that they are allowed to because they're paying you. If you're not getting paid, no one's going to drive you fucking crazy because everybody's doing it for free. Yeah. So um, realize that that comes with the trade-off. If you're fortunate enough to be getting uh, paid for something, you've kind of said to the people paying you, okay, you can drive me fucking crazy for three days. Yeah. While I do my job. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so everyone, please check out his book, 60 Stories About 30 Seconds, How I Got Away with Becoming a Pretty Big Commercial Director Without Losing My Soul, or maybe just part of it. Uh, Mr. Bruce Van Dusen, thank you so much for doing this. Great. Perry, thanks for having me. And uh, I'm so glad you enjoyed the book. And recommend it to your to your friends and and peers in the filmmaking community and um i hope we'll talk again absolutely take care all right thanks